quick one before this episode of the F2 show starts. Completely shameless plug. If you haven't done so already, press the subscribe button. We're trying to reach 100,000 subscribers this year, so we'd be incredibly grateful for any support that you could show. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Enjoy the podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the F2 show by Inside F2. Formula 2 is back, and it's back with a bang, isn't it? Joining me to reflect on a spectacular opening weekend of the season, Aaron Harper and Lawrence Griffin. And, uh, yeah, Formula 1 didn't deliver. Uh, I think Formula 1's uh, struggling a little bit at the moment, pretty finished, isn't it? But Formula 2 is uh, back, and uh, that provided plenty of action, Lawrence, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You can always rely on, on Formula 2 to deliver and for you to go into a a Formula 2 race or a Formula 2 season have absolutely no clue who's going to win. And I think we probably have no clue who's going to win the next race, even though there was one very dominant character. It doesn't really mean anything in in Formula 2 with how up and down it can be. So great to have that excitement if uh, other series aren't quite delivering it. Absolutely. Aaron, good to see cars back on track. I mean, it was action all weekend long, wasn't it? Everywhere you look. It was great to have F2 back on track because of just the sheer unpredictability. But also... It was really good to see the new cars on track and how well they raced. They were superb, actually, in action. The whistling of the aerodynamics, I know, was winding a few people up, but I'm sure that's a quirk we can all learn to grin and bear if the racing remains as high quality and as close as it was. I mean, Bahrain generally a good overtaking circuit, but we still had plenty of action. And even when it wasn't an overtake, there was good battling. So it was was just great all round. Really was, wasn't it? We're going to talk about Pepe Marti and his double podium. We're going to talk about Paul Aron. Uh, we're going to talk about a few of the other rookies as well, because the rookies were absolutely brilliant this weekend. But there's only one place to start, and that is with Zane Maloney. It was a Maloney masterclass, wasn't it, Lawrence? Yeah, a- absolutely. When when you look through the entire weekend, I mean, the pace he had throughout, the, the starts he had, you know, the way he was mo- able to move up through the order in the sprint race and the absolutely electric start he had in that feature race. You just cannot argue with a, a double win in Formula 2. They don't happen by accident. Only, you know, quality, quality drivers pull off those back-to-back wins, sprint race and feature race. And wow, what a start from, from Zane Maloney. I don't think anyone was quite expecting you know him to be the one to take that double win. People have t- spoken so much about Martin Spearman, and you know they didn't deliver it, and Maloney did. So you've got to just take your hat off to him and, and also to the team in terms of getting that new car set up beautifully. What an incredible performance from him. You wait so long for a win, Aaron, and then two come along at, two come along at once. It was, uh, yeah, quite the weekend. And as you say, as Lawrence has just said, you know, I don't think anyone expected that. I think both both of us, actually, Aaron, both, both you and I, predicted he would be the first new winner of the season. I don't think either of us predicted that uh, he would be, uh, yeah, doing the double in Bahrain. What made his double win all the more impressive was the fact that he didn't qualify on pole position. Obviously, we saw Oli Behrman take both wins in Baku last year, and obviously he had pole position for the feature race. So it was super impressive all round, and he was a rookie. But for Zane to do it on a circuit where you're racing at two different times of day, one race is like in the middle of the afternoon and one race is in the early evening. So the, the track temperatures are actually very different. And the way that the car can respond to that can vary quite widely, in fact. So the fact that he did the business in two quite different scenarios and not from pole position in either of them was superb. The fact that the sprint race he came from eighth on the grid, I think, and then mm. obviously the start was just supreme. He was helped a bit by Bortoletto not getting away particularly well, but you know, at the start, you gotta make your chances count. And he, he was brave as well, getting down the inside. Hajar didn't leave him that much space on the inside, and he muscled his way through and controlled the race as well. Those safety car restarts, especially that one later on when O'Sullivan had the soft tires behind him. I thought he was toast, to be honest, but it just disappeared. He just, he, when you're in the lead of a race, you just want to get away. And he did just that. It was, as you say, a Maloney masterclass. This is the thing, though, Lawrence, isn't it? That, you know, we don't know how much pace he had in the bag left. He was out front. He was uh, in both races. He had a bit of a gap. And uh, he, he, you don't know whether he could have gone. I mean, yeah, from, from start to finish in a feature race, he was just on it, wasn't he? Yeah, especially somewhere like Bahrain where tyre wear is, is such a massive factor and it's so easy you know, to have that lightning start, to battle your way to the front, to build that gap. 
and realize you've completely blown your tires and you know to survive the the safety car as well and still you know pull out that gap and still be in such a strong position to the end of the race is incredible and yeah you'd be you'd be daft to just drive off into the distance and burn your tires up so we don't know how much pace he was holding back but what you've got to say is from someone that you know hadn't won a race to someone that is controlling a race that convincingly that bodes really well i mean what a complete weekend in terms of overtaking starting fast being aggressive when you need to controlling the pace and looking so strong out in front you know that will have some people thinking you know those who might have thought it's a martins bearman you know fight for the title this year might have to add a a third name in there Absolutely. It's uh, yeah, it great to hear the Barbados national anthem as well, wouldn't it? I want to see, Zay Maloney fans, I want to see those Barbados flags in the comments. I, I want to see those this uh, great weekend for, for Barbados. I'm just interrupting the podcast because I want to talk to you about motorsporttickets.com and I promise you, you're not going to want to miss out on this one. As the motorsport season starts, now is the best time to secure your tickets before they start to go up in price or to sell out. Motorsporttickets.com have a huge variety of different tickets from Formula 1 race weekends, which of course include Formula 2 and Formula 3, the World Endurance Championship, MotoGP, Le Mans 24 Hours and so many other events that are going on in the world of motorsport. Get your tickets fast now by following the link in the description to see all of their exclusive offers. Right, back to the podcast. Um, we've seen in previous years, Aaron, that, um, you know, we saw with Bortoleso last year in F3. He won the first couple of rounds of the season and he had such a big gap that it took some 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 catching, didn't it? He has a points advantage already. It's only 12 to Pepe Marti, but to, to everyone else, it's, it's, it's obviously quite a big gap, particularly to those two you've mentioned, Lawrence, um, Victor Martins, Oli Behrman, the preseason favourites. Is he going to take some catching, Aaron? Well, it remains to be seen. Let's sort of revisit that after, say, Australia, because... We've got three rounds in about four weeks, which is six races in a Formula 2 calendar. So if he's got, say, a 30-point gap, 40-point gap over the likes of Martins, Behrman, potentially some other championship hopefuls, maybe we can start looking at him as a strong early title favourite. But I think the different circuits we're going to go to in the next couple of rounds will be slightly similar in the way they're, they're going to be set up. I think we're going to see different winners. I don't think we'll see form necessarily consistent across multiple race weekends. I can see someone having like a really big hit of uh, points like Maloney's had, a couple of wins. But we're going to see, I think, drivers getting double podiums and just making these massive leaps forward in the championship. And then it sort of plateaus towards the end of the season. And we the, the fight will develop a little bit later on. But... It might all converge at the at the end of the season. You, you never know, and that's simply because the new cars. Next week in in Saudi Arabia, Pre, Prima might be back. ART might hit their stride. High Tech might get it and hit the nail on the head. So you're never quite sure, especially with the rules change, what what's going to come next. And honestly, with Formula Two, you could say that about every season. Mm. Absolutely. Great weekend for Rodin and their first weekend as a, as a team, obviously, from the transition from, from Carlin as well. So great first weekend for them. Uh, another outstanding performer was Pepe Marti on debut. Uh, yeah, what a, what a debut weekend, Lawrence. Two two podiums, and I don't think it could have got much better for that uh, than that for him, could it? No, absolutely not. You know, qualifying inside the top 10 on your first race, double podiums, you know, having to, to fight hard for both of those and looking really racy not at all looking out of place in formula two you know he's he's someone that did show his class last season in in formula three um you know maybe slightly overshadowed by you know the the excitement around Kimi Antonelli or you know around the the reigning f3 champion Gabriel Bortoleto but you know he's he's proved that he's not to be forgotten about this season and you know if he can keep performing to that level of consistency then that bodes really well not often do you see rookie drivers coming in performing consistently throughout the weekend not making any errors you know this is is really impressive from him from p11 as well i mean it, it was it was it was very impressive aaron wasn't it it's uh, a lot of overtaking but he made those looks made those moves look really easy as well didn't he he did and he, he took his chances and i was just looking before we started recording this obviously he, he came through from p11 but and this isn't to to sort of throw shade on 
his performance in the, in the feature race, but half the top 10 had incidents. So it's just about as much having pace as it is keeping your nose clean. Hadjar got caught up in an incident. Fittipaldi ended up with nowhere to go. Martins had a technical fault. Crawford, a technical failure. Uh, who else? Bortoletto had damage and a penalty. So there was drivers ahead of him who all encountered misfortune. But Pepe Marti kept his head. And for a young man, that is so important. Because we, we saw with Bortoletto, he, he got a bit flustered in those early laps and took a few uh, laps to settle himself back down. And once he did, you could see the skill and the speed come back. So keeping your cool is so vital behind the wheel because you just see the progress that you make, especially in a field as competitive and as close as Formula 2, where you can make those moves and you can make real progress real quickly. It really pays dividends. Hmm. A Formula 2 is such a chaotic you know, series. You see some drivers who seem to get caught up in incidents all the time. When Even when it's not their fault, they just happen to, to see those incidents and some that seem to come through unscathed from every single tricky you know, lap one, turn one. So if he can pick up the habit of having clean races, then that will that will place him in really good stead. Yeah, Campos is an interesting one, isn't it? Obviously, Isaac Hadjar on the front row, obviously after um, Kushmani's disqualification, but yeah, on the front row. Campos also had a really good weekend in Bahrain last season where they won with Ralph Boschong, and then they dropped off a little bit. Can can they maintain this, Lawrence? Can uh, can they can they yeah continue to qualify at the front of the grid and uh, be claiming podiums regularly? I think it remains to be seen. I think definitely having both cars there with such good pace, you know, the result doesn't reflect how good they were this weekend with Hadjar being taken out um, in the feature race by by Bortoletto. But, you know, having both cars there performing consistently rather than, you know, just Ralph Boschung as you had last year is really, really encouraging. But Bahrain is always a bit of an anomaly. It's such a high degradation circuit. The car can behave differently on that track compared to lots of the others. And we see it in Formula 1 as well. It doesn't always necessarily follow that, you know, the form in the next race is going to be quite the same. And also, if you look at where other teams, you know, experienced teams like ART or like Prima, you know, just didn't quite look like they had the same amount of pace as a team like Campos, they're adapting to a, a new, you know, type of car. And those little setup tweaks, you know, they will have learned so much from this weekend. And some of those more experienced teams might well come back fighting next time out. And we can see a totally different set of results with the track being so different as every track is so different to, to Bahrain. So there's no reason they can't continue to perform consistently. But, you know, what I would say is if they're able to be that strong next time out, then then you're really looking at a team that are going to be in the title fight. But like Aaron said earlier, one round uh, of being dominant isn't always enough to, to prove that you're going to have a good season. Mm, absolutely. Okay, moving on then to uh, my favourite Aaron in Formula 2. It's not Aaron Harper, it's Paul Aaron. Um, he, uh, he had a great, great first weekend, didn't he? One minute he was in the gravel in the feature race, the next minute he was in P3. He just kind of appeared from nowhere, didn't he, Aaron? Hey, he did a great job. I mean... He's a former Mercedes junior driver. And Mercedes don't pick anyone to be one of their junior drivers. You've got to have some something going for you. Obviously, they've only got Kimi Antonelli at the moment, and there's a lot of talk around just how good he is. But Paul Aron is no slouch, and he showed that this weekend. I thought he had a really tidy sprint race on his way to a few points, and then the feature race was just superb. He got through on the right strategy towards the end, the safety car obviously playing well, to his tyre strategy. I think he went ran long on softs and then went to hards. And because they were in the heat of the afternoon, hards towards the end were the golden ticket. You had the pace against everyone else whose tyres were just jelly by that point, to be honest. And, you know, like with Pepe Marti, he kept his nose clean, kept it all together. Okay, he was in the gravel. I think that was on the opening lap. And just, yeah, made the most of his opportunities. And, in Formula 2, you've got to take your opportunities to score big when you can, and this will do his confidence the world of good. And it's a great start for him, not only in the series, but with his new team. I tell you what I thought was was incredible from some of the rookies, uh, Pepe Marti, uh, Paul Aron, and a few other uh, the rookies as well, is in a sprint race, the first race of the season, uh, where 
veterans or returning drivers like Victor Martins, like Enzo Fittipaldi, like Isaac Hadjar, cooked their tyres and their tyres were absolutely done. The less experienced, Pepe Marti, Paul Aaron and a few other rookies, like I mentioned, um, were the ones who actually had tyres left at the end, which I thought was was it was incredible. I, you know, as returning drivers, surely they should have more experience of how to, to, to work that Pirelli rubber, right, Lawrence? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it just shows you the the talent of the the rookies that we have this year that we're able to do that. Also shows that it's it's not the easiest thing to do, even if you do have experience. Depending on where you find yourself in the field, you're battling over positions. Very easy to to cook those tires. And you know, just just like you know, we've spoken about Marty, you know, Aaron just having that knack of being in the right place at the right time on the right tire managing the tyre well, staying out of trouble, but, you know, equally climbing up the order, going from, you know, after qualifying in 12th to to finish, you know, to have a fifth in, in the sprint and, and the podium and the feature race, you know, what an in- incredible result. So if you can just keep having that level of consistency, managing the tyres well, you know, that is that is going to really pay off for him throughout the season. We're going to come back to talking about the rookies in a minute. Um, I wanted to, to rewind all the way back to Thursday, it was, uh, when qualifying took place. Uh, and it was a great initial qualifying session, start to the season for, for Jeff Miney, uh, Kush Miney, uh, whatever you want to call him. Uh, it was an Invicta 1-2, and the, the car looks quick over one lap. Obviously, he got disqualified for um, yeah a, a floor issue. Um, yeah, Aaron, talk to me about Kush Miney's qualifying and, and you know it was it was a shame that he got sent to the back of the grid but from a from Invictus perspective they'll be really happy with the one lap pace weren't they both drivers on the front row well Jack Dill will be wondering where this car was last year for him he was yeah. tipped to win the championship and the car didn't want a car in the first few rounds of the season so uh, he'll be gutted that he's not in that seat this year but Kush and Gabriel did a brilliant job in qualifying Miney's first effort was excellent and then his second one was even better. But we should also preface this with, he's a bit of a Bahrain specialist. He did really well last year in Bahrain for Campos. Obviously, Campos had another strong weekend this year in Bahrain. So maybe Campos and Kush Miney tend to like Bahrain and the layout just seems to work for them and and the driver and the cars and the the teams. Obviously, Kush with Invicta now. But I thought also his race craft in the feature race was, was really good. He could have tried to make all that ground back up at the start and been really feisty, but he let the race come to him and was really patient with it and scored a few points, not as many as he would have hoped uh, come Thursday afternoon once he put it on pole, but it's a good recovery. And I think that shows the tutelage under Mika Hakkinen is starting to work. What could have, what could have been for, for Invicta this weekend, you know, with the pace that they had, you saw it in the feature race as they flew through the, the field in formation at the end, making up places, you know, this is, this is a, a weekend where you could say, arguably, they looked like the fastest team out there, you know, so yeah. to not, to not even, you know, get, get a podium out of it you know, it is going to be really disappointing as encouraging as it is, because like we've said before, it's no guarantee they're going to be on the pace next time round. So, you know, what if we were to look back at this at the end of the season and realise that it was a real missed opportunity for Invicta? So I think there'll be some mixed feelings in that that team going into next weekend. But it also shows just how competitive the series is, that the fastest team on Thursday locking out the front row until the disqualification walks away without a podium. Yeah. So it's just so close, isn't it? It's, it's fantastic. It's, as a viewer, as a punter, it's just great to watch. <laughs> Everything is so close. You're never quite sure what's coming next, who's going to win, who's going to be on pole. It's just thrilling. It is thrilling. And what's made, uh, what makes it even more thrilling is the, 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 the title favourites, uh, we're nowhere this weekend, right? Which is, blows everything wide open, doesn't it? What on earth happened to Prima this weekend? Let's start with them. Uh, it just seems like they just couldn't get the balance right, Aaron, didn't it? It was a really weird weekend for Prima, but I, while I was writing some of my articles over the weekend for the website, I did have a look at Prima's recent history in Bahrain. Yeah. In 2023, no points. Yeah. 2022, uh, they had a P2 with Jehan Daravala in the sprint race but everything else was outside the point the feature race was don't even bother remembering it um okay in 2021 oscar piastri did win 
one of the sprint races. But in the feature race, again, they got minor points and Piastri uh, was last. I don't think he finished. He was classified, though. So they're not particularly good around pre around um, Bahrain or Prima. And then Bahrain, as Alex Brundle told us on the preview shows, you know, it's a little bit of an outlier of a circuit. So it can be very different from Bahrain to, to Jeddah because the, the track surface, it's much smoother in, in Jeddah. So you might see all of a sudden Prima, ART are just back at the front, setting the pace. And then we get to see exactly how good Kimi Antonelli is and Oli Behrman can launch his title fight. That said, Antonelli did a great job to come through the field and pick up a point in the feature race. So credit where credit's due. Oli Behrman didn't have a very good weekend, sadly. Car issues, the car went into fail mode, like safe mode at the start of the, the sprint, and then he had to be restarted in the pit lane for the feature race. Damage, if it could go wrong, it did go wrong for Oli Behrman, but... Actually, you'd rather have that weekend first and it stands you in good stead. It's good for your, your, your character building. You'd rather not have that weekend like the penultimate round of the year when you're still fighting for the championship because yeah. then you'd be really squeaky bum time then. You, you took the words out of my mouth in that Prima zero points scored on the opening round of last season uh, and uh, Oli Behrman 14th and 15th in Bahrain. And then he, he came back to qualify P2 in Jeddah. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's not necessarily that the Prima is going to be an awful car all year long. Uh, it could just be a Bahrain specific thing. Um, obviously, Prima, not the only ones to have a, a bit of a torrid weekend. Victor Martins, another title favourite, also had a bit of a torrid weekend. He wasn't on the pace all weekend long, really, was he? Out-qualified by Zach O'Sullivan, outperformed in both races by Zach O'Sullivan, uh, cooked his tyres in the sprint race, uh, could only make his hard tyres work for 10 laps in the feature race where he had to come in and box. And then and then he had a mechanical failure. I mean, it wasn't quite his weekend either, was it, Lawrence? No, and even before that mechanical failure, he just didn't look like he had any pace. No. You know, it was just, it was really bizarre. And we're not used to seeing that from, from him. You know, he's usually so consistently quick and you know we were all expecting him to start his his title charge but he fundamentally looked like he wasn't getting on with the car which i think you know we might all accept quite readily knowing you know that like aaron just said bahrain is such an outlier but the fact that his rookie teammate was able to outperform and, and look so much more comfortable with the balance and the setup of the car you know, I th I think that is that will be quite a, a difficult one for for Martins. You know, he's experienced; he'll know where his strengths lie, and he'll pick himself up and go on to the next race. But you know, you've got to be looking over your shoulder at your young teammate, going, "Hang on, I'm meant to be the team leader here, and he's, he's showing me up." So, I think you know that will be an interesting, you know, inter team battle to to follow throughout the season because ART should, and I, I'm sure will be delivering a, a fast car you know on most weekends um you know throughout the season so those two i think we will see fighting for race wins at some point this year do you reckon it was just because it looked like an alpine that it, he was so slow i was gonna say the same thing yeah it's the, the alpine livery just uh yeah either that or we saw the pace of the alpine in formula one and thought not winning the title this year i'll stay another year in f2 and i'll join in 26 and it needed to shave that blue paint off alpine style yeah, 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 get it gone, exactly. Okay, let's move on to our new feature for this season, Rookie Watch. Uh, so we've already spoken about uh, uh, Pepe Marti and Paul Aron. Uh, let's talk about our pole sitter, uh, Gabriel Bortoletto. Uh, yeah, really solid debut weekend for him, Aaron. It was um, a bit a bit all over the place, wasn't it? He obviously had a poor start in the feature race, made a bit of contact, uh, but uh, the pace was there, wasn't it? Yeah, he had some, some good moments. Obviously, the start of the feature race wasn't one of them and nor was turn one of the feature race but like i said earlier he recovered his composure he showed some pace his sprint race was decent as well points in both races that's a decent start obviously took the pole position i think if he'd got into the lead at turn one i think we might have seen exactly how quick the the invicta car was in race trip but like like Lawrence said the the pair of the invicta cars came through towards the end so the speed was still there for Gabriel. I mean, it was just, I think, down to that turn one and that, that start that kind of undid his race. And obviously that's obvious to say, but, you know, it's, it's just in, it's so important to make a good start. And especially when you're on pole position, you don't, you don't want to surrender that advantage. 
It, un- it unraveled so so quickly for him, didn't he? You know, he had massive wheel spin away from the line. Maloney flies past him, and you just wonder if you know you just you get into the heat of the battle, just make that slightest, tiniest of miscalculation if you're trying to make up for the fact that you were slow off the line. Then all of a sudden, you know that is your hopes of a win gone. You know, if he'd been maybe slightly more conservative in turn one. You know, who knows? He probably would have had the pace to come back through the field and have a proper go at, at Maloney at the end. You know, so that is that is one that he will, I think, kick himself for. You know, later. Obviously, if he wins next next week, you know, then he'll forget all about it. But you know, I think it'll be really a, a case of what could have been. You know, all, all round for the for the team. You know, if they didn't have a disqualification, if they didn't have that incident. I, I think a real shame for them to have missed out on so many points. Definitely. I'm sure the Brazilian fans will be uh, yeah, following him all season long and we'll be talking about him all season long on the F2 show as well. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Uh, Zach O'Sullivan, uh, we've just spoken about it, out-qualified and out-raced. Uh, he's more experienced teammate and probably title favourite, uh, Victor Martins Lawrence. Good uh, good start from him. Yeah, a- absolutely. Yeah, like, like we said, really good start from him looking very solid and yeah definitely excited to see what he can go on and achieve in, in the rest of the season because ART are you know known for producing good cars and last season at least you know there is no second seat curse anymore that seems to have been quite firmly lifted and you know so he should be you know up there and, and challenging Victor Martins for the, for the rest of the season we hope indeed um We've also got uh, Miata as well, Aaron. Um, yeah, a bit of an eventful weekend for him as well, wouldn't it? But the pace seems to be there, P6 in qualifying. And uh, yeah, it's pace shown in the races as well. Yeah, I thought it was a, a solid enough debut in Europe. I, I say European, they were in the Middle East, but uh, outside of Japan, single seaters. I think he's done some endurance racing, possibly in Europe as well. But yeah, a decent start for him. He, he didn't set the world alight. Obviously, his teammate went on to to win both races but I suppose that that's a platform for him to sort of build from and aspire to as well with with trying to chase down Zay Maloney within the team as well so a decent weekend for Return on the Atta. Mm. Now I'm not sure if you were aware but apparently uh, Andrea Kimi Antonelli was making his debut in F2 this weekend I'm not sure if you saw no, any no. interviews no no exactly um, no it was, a, it was a solid weekend obviously the car, the car was um, yeah maybe not uh, a yeah didn't enable him to compete as much as he would have liked to but it was a good uh, good first weekend for him when he obviously outperformed Ollie Berman all weekend long he that move around the outside of Ollie Berman as well in the feature race that was uh, a bit of a statement wasn't it Lawrence yeah it absolutely was because you know you've got a, a young gun coming into a team where the the team leader as it were is meant to be going for for the title and you know Kimi Antonelli just said, I'm having none of that. I'm going to send it right around the outside. Really, really aggressive, really strong. With Berman, who is one of the more aggressive drivers, one of the best at wheel wheel to wheel wheel battle, um, you know, in in the series. So the fact that he's put the moves on him and just generally looked slightly more more comfortable with the car and looked like he had slightly better pace than his than his teammate, you know, that is really, really impressive. And you know, I think there might be some people thinking, you know, Kimi Antonelli's been so hyped up because of the the incredible career he's had so far. And, you know, where's where's the result gone in the first race? Well, just look at how much his teammate has struggled in that car. You know, we've spoken about Bahrain potentially not being the strongest track for Bremer. So, you know, for, for those who are, you know, Kimi Antonelli fans, no need to despair just yet and there's a lot of, of positives to take away from what is you know we can't forget that's still his first race in formula two you know and he's he's jumped a step to get up there so you know we could forgive him for being slightly slow off the mark as it as it is he beat his teammate this weekend so you know a lot to look forward to with him and how important could that single point be we saw in uh, 2007 in formula one it was decided by an eighth place finish which gave one point at the time so 10th and a point could be vital in a championship that could be hyper competitive and super close come the, the checkered flag in Abu Dhabi. It's, it's round one and Aaron is already counting the individual points. It's tense already. There's, you can leave, leave no margin in Formula 2. 
I've got, I'm, I'm just that meme where you've got like all the uh, the string and the Venn diagrams and all the things on the the pin board. <laughs> <laughs> Our very own F1 historian, Aaron Harp. I was, uh, yeah, we, I think we established Kimi Antonelli was one in 2007. Yeah, one years old. So, uh, yeah, absolutely crazy how young he is. <laughs> um, Aaron, a quick word. Oh, we've got Franco Colapinto. Villa Gomez made his debut this weekend. Uh, the PHM boys, Josh Dirksen and Taylor Barnard. Did, did, uh, who stood out for, for you the most out of those four rookies? Uh, I think Franco Colapinto did a really solid job. Picked up some points in the feature race, he'll want to build from that. He admittedly made a mistake, but there was a mistake slash error uh, in qualifying with the DRS. So there's a bit more to come from him. But I was super impressed as well by Taylor Barnard getting the PHM into the top 10. And uh, until Kushmani's penalty, he was going to start the sprint race from pole position. So who knows what he might have achieved from there. Obviously, he still started on the front row. Yeah, he ret- retired, and I think he had a technical failure in the in the sprint race, didn't he? And yes. then, and then, in the in the feature, had a had a slow stop as well, which pretty much ruled him out of contention. So, a really really unfortunate weekend from him because he, he was looking so impressive. You know, I don't think anyone was quite in- expecting him to pull that that qualifying lap out of the bag, but he, but he did. So, more more to come from him for sure. Yeah, great lap by him. And uh, yeah, it, I, I think, uh, so Josh Dirksen stalling on the grid is, I, I think, you, you know, we agreed, didn't we, Aaron? It's solely my fault because every PHM driver that I seem to speak to, uh, we spoke to Brad Benavides, he lost his seat. Uh, we then spoke to Josh Mason, he stalled on the grid in Belgium. Um, and then obviously I spoke to Josh Dirksen and he stalled on the grid in Bahrain. So uh, any, P- I mean, Taylor Barnard, uh, don't, don't speak to me, Taylor Barnard. I don't want to jinx your season. So, uh, yeah. You spoke uh, take... to Jack Crawford last week as well, and he didn't leave the pit lane. Oh, they, yeah, they <laughs> don't. Yeah, so uh, we're really, really uh, encouraging F2 drivers to uh, come on the podcast, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> okay, let's move it on then quickly before we uh, wrap up, guys. Uh, Aaron, I'll come to you first. Your driver of the weekend, if we can. Uh, it's very easy. Zane Maloney, he was just superb. It was first class from the boy from Barbados. Cool. Uh, and Lawrence, your driver of the weekend. So I've actually gone slightly different. No, it has to be Zane Maloney. It can't. Be, it can't be anyone else. You know, we couldn't. We couldn't do him the disrespect of giving any, him anything other than than you know top driver this weekend after performing so well. You know, he he's looked strong at, at periods, but you know, could this be the year that he makes a proper bid for the for the title? I really do hope so. The more drivers that we have in that title fight, the better. And not only has he got some some rivals that we expect to be there you know martins and bearman who will surely challenge him but a whole you know raft of rookies coming up as well who will just complicate that title fight and steal points away from him as well so you know what a wonderful weekend from him and glad to see him sort of stamp his authority on on f2 in 2024 so exciting so much to look forward to isn't there let's take a look at the championship standings before we go then It's obviously Zane Maloney who leads the championship at the end of round one after a magnificent double. A double podium for Pepe Marti as well means he's the highest placed rookie in P2. Paul Aron moves the weekend P3. Strong debut weekend from Gabriel Bortoletto and Zach O'Sullivan. They sit fourth and fifth. Bortoletto's teammate, Kush Miney, will be confident he can fight for points in Jeddah. He's eighth. And Dennis Halger and Isaac Hadjar round out the top ten. And the team standings. Rodin lead the way from fast starting Campos and Invicta. High Tech, ART and MP separated by just five points in fourth, fifth and sixth. Disappointing weekend for Prima. They'll be hoping for more as the season progresses. They're in eighth. Trident, PHM and VAR all yet to get off the board. There we have it then. Formula 2 for 2024 is up and running. One round down, 13 to go. So much excitement still to come. And we do get to do it all again next week in Jeddah. If you've enjoyed the show, as always, make sure you give it a like. As we said earlier on in the podcast, subscribe for more Formula 2 content. We're going to be here all season long. Uh, So, yeah, make sure you get involved in the conversation as well. Give me your thoughts and opinions uh, on social media or on our Discord page. But from me, Fraser Ford, and all of us here at Inside F2, we'll see you next time.